Okay, uh, so my name is Esha Munshi. I'm from uh, Gujarat, India, originally. Uh, by qualification, I'm an architect. I was a practicing architect for 15 years. And uh, for last more than 10 years, I've been into bird watching. So I started with bird photography, then I switched to bird watching, then I switched to bird sound recording, and then I started Feather Library. So um, yeah, that's the initiative which I started back in uh, 2021. Oh, I cannot answer that. It's a very difficult question being a birder, but uh, Depends. Uh, if you ask me uh, which is my favorite bird in terms of the effort I have put to see the bird, then I would have to say Sri Lanka Bay Owl. Uh, we started searching for the bird at 7 in the evening and finally got to see the bird at 2.30 at night. So I think that is the most uh, we have worked after getting a bird. Um, one very uh, special bird close to my heart is Spoonbill Sandpiper, which I went to Bangladesh to see it because I really wanted to see it uh, because it's declining so drastically and that was one of the target birds of life. And yeah, of course, all the colorful birds of Himalaya, Trans Himalaya, and it's just... Uh, colorful chaos as I say it and of course they are very beautiful to look at but yeah I cannot pick one it's like very difficult question what bird I would like to be in my next next life that has to be superb bird of paradise Why? Mm, because when I first so I was very new in birding when I first saw the photo of display ritual of superb bird of paradise and it's like a oval shape with a blue smiley which it does with its feathers and it's a uh, mating display and I could not just believe that that can be a bird and then I read and read about it and I'm and that is one bird which I, I want to see in this lifetime no matter what so yeah that I yeah if you ask what is my favorite bird that is my favorite bird <laughs> so huh in a way, it's not very difficult if you are really passionate about it. But I think the awareness is still lacking in some way. So I think uh, if uh, more and more people are aware about conservation in general, about nature, I think it will make life of the people who are working with conservation much easier. Because then they'll know what efforts they are putting and why they are putting so much of effort into doing something like this. What is my favorite birding destination in India? Ooh, so many. Uh -huh. uh, but I will have to say uh, Sela Pass in Arunachal Pradesh. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> I would not come back. I would stay in the generals all the time and I would see all the 10,000 birds of the world if there was no financial issues. It, life is set. I mean, I can, and there's no thinking of second thinking about it. It's that easy. Uh, that's an interesting question that um, requires like philosophical answer, but I think uh, birds have taught me to see beauty everywhere. I mean, uh, so that little joys of, and also it has like taught me the little joys of whenever you, you see a new bird and the smile which comes on your face like it was yesterday for Spiny Babbler. Uh, so when you go and you find a new bird and the, the happiness which you get, um, little things you appreciate even around the birds, the traveling which requires for you to ch chase the birds and it makes you take, it makes you to go to so many places where generally people would not even think of going and yeah so many adventures, so many, bird, birding has taught me everything who I am today. Funny moments. Yeah, yeah okay so <laughs> uh, 
we were uh, we had planned the first pelagic trip of the coast of Gujarat uh, with all the permissions and everything because of the uh, vicinity to Pakistan border to go in the sea is not that easily allowed so we had taken like multiple permissions from all the uh, things you you know all the agencies you require to and it was a four day uh, going in inside the sea and staying there for four days around 100 kilometer offshore and two days had passed and we had not seen a single pelagic bird pelagic birds are the birds which stay in the sea and don't come on the land so we were just roaming around and it was hot and it was we were just so disappointed and next morning so we were all sleeping after two days of you know not seeing any bird and then someone just as a prank just shouted mass booby mass booby and everyone was up with the jerk and with the camera that where is it where is it and it turned out it was a prank and that was a very frustrating and funny moment at the same time a typical routine ideal routine i would say would be get up early morning wear your shoes get your binoculars go to the unknown places and simply watch birds and come back at night and go to sleep peacefully when i started birding it was like i bought my first uh, birds of uh, indian subcontinent book and i was like my goodness how are you supposed to remember all these names and the first bird which i saw was black crown night heron so itself it was a quite long name and i was like that's one bird and there are 1300 and odd birds here how one person is supposed to remember all the names and everything and identify identify especially the small brown ones which which are really confusing i think the way to do is, is the more you get into it the more passion you have things become really easier as you go along and you can start with easy words and maybe make your way down to the difficult birds and go on yeah we do have myths about birds in india for example uh, both good and bad i mean uh, so spotted owlet if a spotted owlet is heard uh, in the morning it is considered to be a good omen and uh, the owls are used uh, the nails of the owls are used for black magic and all sorts of things are there in india also but we are trying to you know make people aware when we go to the tribal areas that you know no this is a bird it's just a bird let it be a bird mm -hmm. you know so slowly i think we are trying to tell people about make people aware about those things that uh, you know they should get out of the myths and see the reality what is feather library oh it's feather library uh the name says all but um, uh, uh, feather library is an organization which ties up with rescue centers um, and uh, requests the rescue centers and creates this uh, mou with rescue centers that whatever bird would not survive there they let feather library digitize their uh, flight feathers so that's wing feathers and tail feathers because um, in any bird photography you see the body colors you see the body patterns you see the body feathers basically but the flight feathers are always hidden so unless and until you open the wing or the bird is seen in flight it's very difficult to uh, know even the number of feathers uh, so there is a whole science of feathers which is called plumology uh, like there is a whole science of bird eggs which is called oology and everything falls under ornithology but so there is a whole science of plumology which has certain um, uh, standards and all those things and there was no database uh, for these things for india and i thought that uh, if there is none then why don't i create one then uh, another good part was that whatever birds used to uh, not survive at the rescue centers they either throw it away bury it or burn it so it's about it's like creating data out of waste otherwise so 
at least after the death also the data is not so whenever the bird comes first uh, always there is identification of the bird that uh, we give it the, so we mark the common english name scientific name uh, and the details related to its death so cause of death date of death area of death and uh, whether it's a male or a female or a juvenile or which stage of life the bird is. Uh, that being the basic data. The basic data is mostly for conservation. So for example, if there are lots of window hits, then we come to know that, okay, these many species are likely to be more uh, prone to window hits or these many species are likely uh, to be uh, you know, the cause of death would be vehicular hits and we can work on awareness for that. After that, basic uh, morphometrics are measured. So, uh, overall body length, wingspan, one wing dimension, tail length, etc, etc. Then the head dimensions are measured. So, beak length, head length, um, gape length. Uh, and the leg dimensions, so femur, tarsometatarsus, uh, and uh, tibiotarsus, and the digits, so for the legs, and the color of the eye, the color, so the skin part, the color of the base of the bill, color of the eye, and the color of the legs. All these things is maintained in an Excel sheet, and for each specimen which comes to Feather Library, before we do anything with the bird, all these dimensions are taken and measured and uh, kept for analysis. Uh, and there have been amazing discoveries like uh, in some species we think which is same looking, there's a slight difference in male and female or you know, there, there's a... Uh, for example, uh, jungle manna uh, versus common manna, then there's a slight difference in the size. And all these measurements when taken in point mm, it's going to create a massive database uh, for the future museums. To digitize feathers of all 10,000 birds of the world. <laughs> Really? Yeah, that's that's the ultimate future plan, yes. But right now I'm planning to expand in India and uh, trying to get as many species as possible, at least one specimen each so that we have some data about the feathers and uh, tie up with institutions like BNHS, SACON and other institutions where I can collaborate with them to create this digital the most important aspect of Feather Library, which I I think personally is that it is, it is digital and it's open to all. So that thing is not usually found. So maybe pursue them to go digital and maybe open to all, yeah. So um, as I said that all the dimensions which we are taking, that in itself is a large data set. Also, we are uh, measuring each feather length and um, finding out how many primaries or how many secondaries or how many tail feathers a species has. Uh, also, the feather can be used for uh, toxicology. It can be used for uh, DNA sampling. So, one single feather can come to uh, aid for many other things except just the beauty, beautiful feathers, yeah. So when I started Feather Library, no. <laughs> I trained with my co-founder. Uh, he works as a curator at a rescue center back in Ahmedabad. And he taught me how to deal with dead birds. And third bird which I had was an Indian pitta and he oh. told me to deal with it. And I'm like, no, I cannot. And he was like, do you want to do this? Then you have to do it, you know. So, th he taught me how to switch from being a bird watcher to a kind of a doctor where you don't have emotions involved and you just do something because you have to do it. Um, after a few months, I did go to Cornell Lab of Ornithology to learn the art of uh, taxidermy, how to make round skin specimens 
and uh, how to properly create extended wing specimens. So extended wing we already had incorporated in feather library but that, that was a very basic way like what we knew at that time. But then I learned there how what, there should be some pinning involved and there should be some procedure involved in order to make the nice looking extended wing specimen. So yeah, I went there for two weeks and I learned a lot. I worked in the museum there. Feathers are the only thing which is unique to birds. So, and since I'm obsessed with birds, I thought I should do something which is uniquely only specifically for birds. And yeah, I've all, I have all, always been uh, interested in feathers actually. Uh, so if I would find a roadkill, I would see its feathers. And um, I did a uh, course in ornithology from Cornell and there was a whole chapter about feathers and uh, plumages. And when I went through it, it was just so inspiring that Feathers have so many things like, I'll give you an example that when a bird molts, right? Oh, oh, every year the bird molts, all its flight feathers. So when the feather is not, let's say it removed one feather from the wing. How does the bird know that that feather is missing and there it has to grow a new feather? There are specialized uh, receiver feathers inside the skin of the bird, like just adjacent to the shaft of the feather that says that this feather right now here is missing. So the bird should send all the protein to that particular feather number. And so that is also a type of feather. Like, uh, you might have seen in barbets you have bristles that's also a type of feather yeah. so feathers can vary and this phyloplumes what I'm talking about the antenna feathers for the feathers like it's so difficult to see them even if you have the bird in hand so there's just so much to know about feathers that the eyelashes of the birds are also feathers so it's just, it's just fascinating very difficult <laughs> <laughs> very very difficult if you, but if you got a single feather and you have to identify the bird again depends um, so if you have a body feather uh, so body feathers are contour feathers which has a different shape of the feather those are really difficult to identify because let's say there is a gradation from white to brown um, then it becomes really difficult to identify that okay this belongs to this particular species as far as flight feathers are concerned, they are not that difficult to identify. So now I can, I can say that I can identify 100 flight feathers, but those which I have seen, not the ones which I have not seen. But it requires a lot of practice. It's like starting from scratch because a common mina, which is a brown looking bird, none of its flight feathers are brown. Everything is black and white. So if you find a black and white feather, it could be, belong to common manna, but you would be imagining a brown feather, which is not the case. So it's quite complex in itself and each bird has around somewhere between 5,000 to 25,000 feathers, mm -hmm. each bird. So from where the feather is, that's very important in order to identify the feather. Not the age, because uh, what raptors do is they change their plumage every year and that's why it's easier to track the age because they keep on molting to adulthood for seven years at least seven years like exceptions but standard is seven years so that every year the they are still going from juvenile to adult for seven consecutive years so also in girls uh, uh, for three years, I think they required to go to adulthood. All these small birds, they go to adulthood pretty quickly. And once they reach the adulthood plumage, then they'll just keep on repeating that. They would not change their plumage. You can always identify the juvenile plumage and the adult plumage. 
बट द गुड थिंग अबाउट रैप्टर्स इज वाई वी कैन एज दम इज बिकॉज ऑफ दिस रीजन दैट दे टेक अ लॉन्ग टाइम टू रीच एडल्ट हुड बिकॉज देर लाइफ स्पैन इज लॉन्ग दिस स्मॉल बर्ड्स दे रीच एडल्ट हुड सो क्विकली एंड देन दे कीप ऑन रिपीटिंग द सेम प्लूमेज ओवर एंड ओवर अगेन Uh, I'm not thought about it. Uh, I'm planning to um, start a people participation kind of a thing, but I'm not too sure because there, as I said, there are so many variation when it comes to feather. So right now, I want to keep it organized and at least let the basic data be there, and then maybe. tie up with some institutes and make you know make it a formalized kind of an entity not a kind of a social media where everyone can post and because we have a, a feather identification group on social media and it's not possible for us to id all the feathers because so far we have also not seen all the feathers so i think we'll wait for that mm-hmm. so the i think the main aspect about the family is uh, i would say that in morphometrics if i say it's the head aspect so the bill shape the bill size all those things are quite similar the body length may keep on changing the size may change but within the families i think the basic head pattern stays the same i would say that there are body feathers which are contour feathers so which has a this kind of a shape you know very fluffy and there are down feathers which are inside the contour feathers so it's like this jacket so this jacket has down feathers inside but to keep the down feathers in its place contour feathers works as a skin so overlap of contour feathers is what gives the birds its its shape and then there are wing feathers so flight feathers which are wing feathers and tail feathers and then there are uh, receptive feathers which are bristle and the phyloplumes i talked about so ideally you can categorize this in three parts contour feathers and down feathers which makes the body flight feathers so wing feather and tail feathers and the receptive feathers which are the bristles and the phyloplumes which are very difficult to see so yeah oh it was amazing i mean one week flew by and i didn't even realize that it has been one week and it's time to leave but uh, yeah i had a great time meeting new people photo ktm was amazing it was a completely different experience for me yeah i had a great time the birding in kathmandu was very good because i wanted to see one bird and i saw that which was spiny babbler but uh, i got some nice recordings also and uh, yeah it was quite nice uh, i was there only for a day but so didn't could not explore much but yeah it was good uh, thank you yeah this much